Skyler's parents are beside themselves. Their daughter is gone. Can you imagine? It's evil. Tonight on an all new 2020, Unfriended. A popular teenage girl lured from home for a mysterious joyride in the middle of the night, but she never comes back. I was scared to death. I didn't know where my baby was. Does this creepy game by BFFs, recorded on a cell phone, hold an answer? Would you guys rather suffocate or get shot? Get shot. Shot. Drowning or suffocating? Suffocating. Tonight, 2020, taking you inside a jaw-dropping mystery. It's a race against time at this point. And the secret world of Mean Girls Gone Wild. Give me the phone. No, this is over. This is over. Hurry up. From cryptic messages on Facebook and Twitter to a real-life crime scene in the woods. Scholar screaming why. What happens when three's a crowd and one person gets cast aside? What secrets do they have? And who do you believe when pretty little liars see to be everywhere. Her words were, I have to tell you the truth about what happened last night. Tonight, what can happen when you get unfriended? Best friends from hell. There couldn't be a more fitting description. Here now, David Muir and Elizabeth Vargas. Good evening. Your teenagers could be planning it right now, this Friday night, sneaking out of your house, joyriding around town. But for one girl, a midnight joyride would be just the start of a mystery that would devastate a small community. Where was Skylar Niece? And what did she mean by this ominous tweet? Hashtag if I could get away with it. That's the question, get away with what? And right here tonight, we take you inside a massive search, the powder keg of high school, where some of the most important clues are hiding in plain sight. Those texts and tweets and Facebook fights between BFFs, where getting unfriended is just the beginning. Here's Ryan Smith. They were 16 and inseparable. Best friends, high school sophomores, Sheila, Skyler, and Rachel. It was always those three together. You barely ever saw one of them by themselves. Silly in their selfies. Giggly teenage girls. They're pretty, they're sociable, they're popular. But behind their smiles, secrets that would shock everyone they knew. The level of deception, it's mind boggling. The police were just as shocked as we were. No one was expecting anything like that. Pure evil. Nestled in the Green Mountains of West Virginia, the city of Morgantown, home to West Virginia University, known as a friendly family place. What's it like here in Morgantown? It's peaceful. It's a small town that's growing really fast. Nice people. Dave and Mary Niece live in an apartment in the tiny Morgantown suburb of Star City. Dave works at a local Walmart. Mary at a medical office. Their lives wrapped around their only child, Skylar. Hey, gorgeous. Treasuring every spin. What a beautiful ballerina. Every laugh. <laughs> and every childhood memory. It was the time she had the tea party for me. And after Mary came home, she noted that Skylar couldn't reach a faucet. And I've been drinking toilet water for the whole tea party. That was a good memory. At the time, it wasn't a good memory. <laughs> yeah, I'm a crazy girl. Daddy's a crazy boy. <laughs> she was daddy's little girl. I spoiled her beyond rotten. Skylar was very loyal to her friends, the people she thought was her friends. When Skylar was eight years old, she met another spirited child with whom she developed an instant bond. Her name was Sheila Eddy, and they became thick as thieves. If they weren't together, they were on the phone together. And that's literally 24 hours a day. I'm serious. It was always, you saw one of them, you saw the other one. <laughs> what was your relationship oh, like with Sheila? <laughs> like wants to yeah. turn away. She's like a part of our family. She really was. I mean, just like one of our kids. The limb burns. As a teenager, Skylar had a 4.0 GPA, a part-time job at Wendy's, and an active social life. In their freshman year at University High School, Skylar and Sheila meet the striking redhead, Rachel Schof. Their duo becomes a trio. Kelly Kearns was close to Rachel. She called me her cool aunt. She was like a daughter to you? Yes. Kelly says Rachel was charismatic, popular, and talented, cast as the lead in the school play. What was she like on stage? She was a natural. 
On Rachel's 15th birthday, Rachel introduced Kelly to her new best friends, Sheila and Skylar. Here they are that night. They were two adorable little girls smiling up at me, you know, just looking so angelic. But that vision of angels would soon be shattered. July 5th, 2012, Skylar finishes a night shift at Wendy's. Skylar walked through the door and gave her mom a hug and said, I love you, mom. She hugged me and said, I love you, dad. She went to bed. The next day, Dave and Mary go to work. But when he returns home that afternoon, Skylar's bedroom door is still closed. I knocked on her door. There was no answer. So I said, Sky, come on, you got to get up. And I still didn't get an answer. So I opened the door. I looked down at her bed and it hadn't been slept in. And it scared me. So I immediately called Mary. She said, she's not home. And I said, no. Concerned, his next call, Sheila. She answered on her first ring. I said, you got any clue where Skylar is? She said, no. I said, when's the last time you talked to her? She said, last night about midnight. Looking for clues in Skylar's bedroom, Dave discovers something out of place. When you came in here that day, describe what this looked like. The screen was gone completely, and I found it in her closet. And the window was open about that much, so she can get her fingers up and lift it back up. I found the bench right here. Outside the house, Dave points out where he saw a bench, a way for Skylar to climb back into her bedroom. Then I knew, oh my God, she snuck out last night and she's not home. And then I started freaking. It's now 4 p.m. and it's time for Skylar's next shift at Wendy's. Skylar had never missed work, but today she's a no-show. Wendy's called and said, hey, is Skylar coming to work today? And I said, oh, Jesus. Mary said, call 911. Long County 911, do you have an emergency? I have a 16 year old daughter who apparently snuck out of her room last night. She has not been home, hasn't went to work, can't get a hold of her from any of her friends. I am scared to death. Has she done this before? Um, no. Just then, Mary gets a phone call from Skylar's best friend, Sheila. And what did she say? Her words were, I have to tell you the truth about what happened last night. She proceeded to tell me that. Her, Skylar, and Rachel had snuck out the night before and that they had driven around Star City, were getting high, and that the two girls had dropped her off at the end of the road because she didn't want to wake us up sneaking back in. I was scared to death. I mean, I, was, I didn't know where my baby was. It was horrible. Sheila and her mother come over and offered to help in the search for Skylar. We immediately went looking for her, gone door to door, and we just we couldn't find her. But then Mary remembers what will become a major key to finding Skylar's whereabouts. Mary said, oh, what about the surveillance? We got surveillance at our apartment. The surveillance camera, intended to capture intruders, instead reveals this grainy image of that night. A car pulls up at 12.30 a.m., 30 minutes after Sheila says she dropped Skylar back near home. Minutes later, Skylar is seen sneaking out of the house. She slips into the car and disappears. What were you thinking when you saw her head flash on that screen and she's walking to that vehicle? For a second, I felt relief because at least I know she didn't get abducted or anything, you know? And it wasn't like she was pushed in. She willingly got in the car. What did police tell you that they thought happened? They thought that Sheila had dropped her off and Skylar came back home and then snuck out again. For Officer Jessica Colbank and Corporal Ronnie Gaskins, the video is their best and only clue. What were you looking for? Anything. Trying to get pictures of the tires, the rims, but it's just too grainy. And it just raised millions of other questions of who did she go with and where did she go? Next, what happened to Skylar? Everyone has their own theory. Got drunk and fell and hit her head. Somebody maybe followed her home. She met someone on the internet. Somebody's just too scared to tell us what really happened. Stay with us. 2020's Unfriended continues. Once again, Ryan Smith. This is the last sighting of 16-year-old Skylar Niece. Surveillance video outside of her home in West Virginia. An eerie vision as she sneaks out of her bedroom, enters an unknown car, and vanishes. So 
surveillance video from the James Place apartments show the 16-year-old girl willingly leaving the compound. A parent's worst nightmare. Anyone with information on Skylar's whereabouts. She seems to have left home voluntarily, so police do not activate an Amber Alert. Officer Jessica Colbank is assigned to the case two days after Skylar's disappearance. Did you think it was a runaway case at that point? It does happen. Uh, kids run away. They come home a couple days later, or the parents find them. Skyler's parents, Dave and Mary, are frantic. Dave pleads on local TV for help, begging his daughter to come home. We love you. Come home as soon as you can, baby. Honey, if you're scared, don't be scared. You're not in trouble. We need to talk, and that's all, honey. Just come home. Each time they get calls with possible Skyler sightings, they rush into action. I'd jump in my car and fly to the place they thought they saw Skylar. I'd go down to the supermarket, scream her name. I mean, everywhere they thought they saw Skylar, we were there. Skylar's friends were worried, but hopeful. Morgan Lawrence has known Skylar since they were three years old. I thought maybe there was a fight, maybe there was something that made her upset, and that she'd be, you know, she'd be back the next day. I thought maybe she just, something happened at home, she wanted to get away. Amaret Hughes, another friend, writes Skylar messages on Facebook, pleading with her to come home. Hi, beautiful, I love you and I miss you. Come home soon. The inseparable trio of Skylar, Rachel and Sheila, is now missing a key member. As for Rachel, just hours after Skylar's disappearance, she's happily posing for pictures on a boat with her family friend, Kelly Kearns. But Kelly says Rachel is worried about her missing friend. I mean, she was texting all the time. She seemed urgent. Meanwhile, her other best friend, Sheila, is in constant contact with Skylar's parents, helping them post missing person posters. Tweeting messages like this, was really waiting for Skylar to come home today. Just days after Skylar's disappearance, Sheila comes to the niece's home, devastated, with a special request. She says, is it okay if I go back and sit in Skylar's room for a minute, for a few minutes? She was crying, Sheila was, uh, crying pretty hard, and she was sitting on her bed, so I just sat down on the bed beside her and rubbed her back, so I was trying to you know, console her, make her feel better. She was going through the same thing we were going through, just at a smaller level, you know. I mean, this is our baby that's gone, and we're flipping out, and she's, her best friend's gone. I mean, it, it's horrible. Days turn into weeks, and still no sign of Skylar. No activity on her cell phone or bank card. And her parents doubting the runaway theory. She didn't take her cell phone charger. She didn't take her contact lens solution. Apparently, she was planning to come back fairly quickly. And in tight-knit Morgantown, people are searching for Skylar and wondering what could have happened to her, like local crime writers Jeff Fuller and Daylene Berry. There were lots and lots of rumors floating around. Got drunk and fell and hit her head. Somebody had followed her home. She'd met someone on the Internet. And then a possible break in the case. Two bank robberies in nearby Blacksville. Corporal Ronnie Gaskins hears rumors that money from the robberies was used to buy drugs for a local teen party. Skylar had supposedly overdosed on heroin. She died. Uh, people there panicked, and they disposed of the body. And where did that lead take you? We weren't coming up with anything. Sheila and Rachel, the last two people to see Skylar, have nothing to add to their story. They picked up Skylar at 11 p.m took a joyride through the winding back roads of rural Star City, smoked pot, then dropped her off before midnight. Very often the last person to see the victim alive is looked at with grave suspicion. In this case, the girl's story seemed relatively innocent, so police had no reason to believe both of them were lying. But for Officer Colbank, it's the small, unspoken signs that make her suspicious. Take me back to that moment where you go to speak to Sheila the first time. Just complete blank on emotions. There was absolutely nothing. It was like iced over. It made me uneasy. Colbank's meeting with Rachel, the high school drama star, also strikes her as odd. She was really nervous. Which has got to be a red flag. What does she have to hide? There stories were verbatim the same. No one's story is exactly the same unless it's rehearsed. And she's an actress, so she can memorize lines. I'm sure they had it written down somewhere. Okay, this is our story. We've got to stick to it. Everything in my gut was Sheila is acting wrong. 
Rachel is scared to death. But police don't know what Rachel and Sheila are hiding or why. Meanwhile, Skyler's parents are grasping for any clues, taking a closer look at the bad influence Sheila had become on their daughter. Sneaking out at night, you know. Found some marijuana in Skyler's pocket one time. Here it was Sheila's. We didn't like the way Sheila acted a lot of times, but being she was Skyler's best friend, we kind of overlooked it. It's becoming clear that the smiling face of Skyler's BFF was just a facade. You started interviewing people about Sheila. How would they describe her? What was she like? Shady, sketchy, um, sneaky, and pretty manipulative. Skyler's friend Morgan says Sheila rubbed her the wrong way. She was very self-centered. She would almost do whatever it took to kind of get her way. Amorette says Skyler confided in her that there were cracks in the clique. Her best friends were snubbing Skyler. These pictures that Sheila posted on the website Meet Me suggest Skyler had become a third wheel. She just thought that they were becoming closer, so they were just pushing her out. She was really upset about it. The slights were sometimes subtle, but clear as day for Skyler. They were dressed the same. They both wear dresses or skirts, but they wouldn't tell Skyler, and they would say it was more like a coincidence, but I secretly think that they planned it. Are Sheila and Rachel hiding a secret about what happened to their best friend? Officer Colbank is determined to find answers to bring the niece's daughter home. I promised Dave and Mary the very first day that I met him. I said, I'm a bulldog in my investigations. I said, I don't care if it takes me 10 years to find the truth. I will eventually find it. Next, the girls play a strange secret game captured on camera by Skylar. Drowning or suffocating? Suffocating. Where would it lead? Stay with us. So, do you think those girls, Skylar's BFFs, are hiding something? And what is it? We're live tweeting throughout tonight's show, so let us know. Use the hashtag ABC2020. David and I will be right back. 2020 continues with Unfriended. Here again, Ryan Smith. Police have begun to suspect that Sheila and Rachel, best friends of missing 16-year-old Skylar Niece, are lying about what happened the night she vanished. The first red flag? Tension in the relationship. Officer Jessica Colbank pours through Skylar's old Facebook and Twitter posts. What she finds sets off alarms. You could tell she was mad at someone. In the weeks before she vanished, Skylar had posted angry messages. There's just something about you I can't stand. People can be so mean for absolutely no reason. Hope you don't expect me to give a anymore. Hashtag bye. And the final tweet she wrote sent 10.48 p.m. the night she disappeared. You doing like that is why I will never completely trust you. She didn't trust someone. That was the issue. And perhaps the most suspicious posting by Skylar, this strange game among best friends. Sheila asks Rachel and Skylar, how they prefer to die. Would you guys rather suffocate or get shot? Get shot. Shot. Drowning or suffocating? Suffocating. It's almost the same thing. I know, but it's not. And when police review Rachel and Sheila's cell phone messages after Skylar went missing, they note a curious absence. There was no mention of Skylar whatsoever. It was very odd. It's as if she just erased it from her, for, you know, from her mind forever. Skylar has been missing for months. Despite her parents' concerns about Sheila's bad influence, they're convinced that Sheila is simply grieving over her lost best friend. Even as the police are saying to you they've got some suspicions about Sheila, you were thinking, hey, back off of this girl. I even told them, I said, will you please leave her alone? She's going through enough. I said, those girls have just lost their best friend. Will you chill out on her for a while? What the nieces don't know is that police are finding actual evidence of the girl's deception. Stay please. Sheila and Rachel told police their joyride with Skylar was contained to the Star City area. Desperate for clues, police scoured surveillance video from local businesses. It paid off. This video captures Sheila's car at 12.39 a.m. heading north, away from Star City. That was the first variation in their stories, is where they drove around. And there's not just video. Cell tower pings from that night 
placed them in the backwoods town of Blacksville. That just blew their whole, oh, we stayed in Star City. You're 45 minutes away from where you're saying you're at. You can't do that. You're not Houdini. So you say, aha, we have this information. What happens when you speak to Rachel and Sheila? They change their story to fit. Oh, sure, we were in Blacksville. I forgot that. Oops. Their carefully rehearsed stories are now mismatched. Sheila, the high school drama queen, claims Skyler didn't join them for the ride to Blacksville. But Rachel, the high school drama star, says she did. They're starting to differ, at least from Rachel's perspective. It sounds like the actress is starting to forget her lines. Oh, yeah. She had to come up with her own lines. And that's where she really started tripping up. Once you start seeing inconsistencies in a story, it's all over. The person's lying. And then you must ask the question, why would they lie? Sheila is adamant that her version of the night's events is true. She volunteered to take a polygraph. What did that say to you? Arrogance. I think she thought she was smart enough to outsmart a machine. So she took the polygraph and what happened? Failed miserably. Rachel also agrees to take a polygraph, but en route on the day of the test, she gets scared, jumps out of her father's car and flees. She jumped out of a moving vehicle to avoid it. If you haven't done anything wrong, why won't you take this test? Now, armed with surveillance video and cell phone records that prove the girls have been lying, police tell Dave and Mary Niece that Skyler's best friends have a secret. At that point, we knew they had to know something. So we pushed. Your mission is to try to get their secrets out of them. Exactly. The nieces start posting about karma on Facebook, writing that the girls need to tell what they know. Classmates and even strangers are putting pressure on Sheila and Rachel. Anonymous tweets like this one, pretty little liars keep on lying. All eyes were on Sheila and Rachel. You know, you can't be part of the trio and not have any clue what's going on. Kelly Kearns, close friend with Rachel and her mother, hears the rumors that Rachel is stonewalling police. I'd get a text from people, why isn't your friend's daughter cooperating? So I'd send Rachel a text. What the heck are you doing? Even those closest to Rachel are wondering, what is she hiding? I said, was Skylar alive when you left her? Yes. We didn't do anything to her. I think that in this situation, you cannot lessen the importance of peer pressure. Rachel seems particularly affected. As the lead in that year's school play, she is accustomed to adulation. It's like she was getting booed in a performance. It's that type of level of ostracizing her. She couldn't handle that. One night, almost six months after Skylar went missing, Rachel cracks, apparently having a nervous breakdown. Her mother calls 911. I have an issue with a 16-year-old daughter of mine. I can't control her anymore. She's screaming. She's running through the neighborhood. Give me the phone. No, this is over. This is over. Hurry up. No, no, Oh, God. Hurry up, please. Seemingly suicidal, Rachel is admitted into a local psychiatric hospital. What happens there has never been revealed. But immediately upon release, Rachel is driven directly to meet with police. She's just nervous. She's shaking. And the impression I got was, all right, now the truth's finally going to come out. Next, you'll never believe what Rachel tells police. This was something totally different from what you expected. It struck me as unbelievable. There was no accident. 2020's Unfriended continues. Once again, Ryan Smith. University High's leading lady, Rachel Schoaf, is not able to keep up the act anymore. Six months after the disappearance of Skylar Niece, Rachel's abandoning the role of heartbroken best friend and going from a psych ward straight into the interrogation hot seat. She was just nervous. She was shaking. She's finally about to come clean to police about what really happened to her 16-year-old BFF. It was a plot twist no one saw coming. The first words out of her mouth were, we stabbed her. This was something totally different from what you expected. It took us a minute to kind of <laughs> settle down. OK, what do you mean, you stabbed her? Rachel tells Corporal Ronnie Gaskins she and Sheila began plotting to kill Skylar months earlier during science class. They were joking how they would dispose of a body. Then it got more sinister. We need to figure out how we're going to kill her. They don't 
know how to use guns, so they would use knives to stab her. Rachel wanted Skylar dead now because, get this, she was about to leave for church camp. So one midsummer's night, she and Sheila gather some critical tools, a shovel, paper towels, bleach, wipes, a change of clothes, and kitchen knives, and they arrange to meet with Skylar. Remember this grainy surveillance video? Police couldn't make out the car. Turns out it had been Sheila's all along. 12.30, they arrive at Skylar's house, the knives hidden in their hoodies. Five minutes later, Skylar emerges. They drive out of Star City, past Blacksville, and across state lines to Pennsylvania, and into the woods of a town called Brave, where Skylar is about to face the fight of her young life. And they're driving on this road that we're on right now. Yes. And Skylar's in the back seat having no idea what's about to happen. She has no clue. Gaskins takes me back to the murder scene. Man, this is dark and creepy. I mean, this Just is... Just imagine these girls are out here after midnight. And recounts what Rachel confessed. All three girls exit the car and they walk down this road. The girls find a grassy area to sit and smoke marijuana. Skylar gets up and starts walking back to the car to get a lighter. That's when they execute their secret plan. Sheila and Rachel get up behind her and count. One, two, three. And on three, that was the time for them to start stabbing Skylar. Right here, Skylar is being stabbed by her two best friends. Yes. Skylar takes off running with her two friends giving chase. Rachel tackles Skylar and the pair continue to repeatedly stab their BFF. And according to Rachel, Skylar screaming why. And then they try slitting her throat because they had read that it would kill her quicker if they cut her jugular. The plan was to bury her, but the ground was too hard. So instead, they drag her body to the side of the road and cover her with branches, rocks, and leaves. They don't even bother to really conceal her. They uh, change into clean clothes, they wipe down the car, and they left. It's like nothing happened. This was calculated, planned out, thoroughly thought of before this night. The perfect murder plot. Everything planned to the T. But why? Her only answer to that was, we just didn't like her. What do you mean, you just didn't like her? We just didn't like her. But why not? Did you ever get the sense with Rachel that she was really remorseful? She seemed to be relieved yeah. that the truth has been told. She doesn't have to hold it in anymore. It's not eating at her anymore. Shockingly, even though Rachel confessed, Gaskins doesn't arrest her. So we had no body. We had no physical evidence. I mean, we had all this circumstantial evidence, but we need something more concrete. And there have been no cracks in Sheila's armor. So to try and nail her, that night, police put a wire on her friend Rachel, hoping Sheila incriminates herself. But Sheila doesn't take the bait. Instead, the two killers take this smiling selfie together. Sheila tweeting, finally got to see Rach. Then, a break. Police think they have an ace in the hole, linking Sheila to the murder. They find traces of blood in her car. We had to do a DNA confirmation. Meanwhile, Rachel continues to give critical details to police. Details Skylar Nisa's parents so desperately await, like the location of Skylar Nisa's body. In this area right here is where we're able to finally locate Skylar's remains. She was one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe seven steps away from the road. Back in Star City, the Nice family is holding a vigil on what would have been Skylar's 17th birthday. They are finally told the news they've been dreading. Skylar has been murdered. I was outraged. I was a mess. All these emotions run through my head at once. The search for Montegalia County teenager Skylar Nice is over. Skylar was our world, and now she's not here. Soon the news breaks publicly. Father, we thank you for joining us here today. But not the identities of the killers. And immediately, Sheila Eddy takes to Twitter to join the chorus of grief. Worst day of my life. The pain is real. And rest easy, Skylar. You will always be my best friend. At the same time she is pretending to mourn online, Sheila is brazenly taunting police, tweeting messages like, wonder if there's a law and order SVU where they don't figure it out. And we really did go on three, a seemingly blatant reference to the crime. 
But what Sheila doesn't know is that authorities get their biggest break yet. Conclusive evidence linking her to the murder. A DNA match confirms that blood from the trunk of Sheila's car is Skyler's. It's that final piece that really nails Sheila. That was news that I was waiting to hear. Finally, with enough evidence to arrest Sheila, Gaskins closes in and tracks her to the Cracker Barrel, where she is having breakfast with her mother. I just want to be able to get her right then and there, get her into custody. It's a race against time at this point. Right. We're not just dealing with a 16-year-old girl. This is a cold-blooded murder. It's point. the end of the road for Sheila. She is leaving the Cracker Barrel just as Gaskins pulls up, cuffing the teen killer right there in the parking lot. I advised them she was being charged with the murder of Skylar Nice. It's also a huge victory for that young cop who wouldn't quit, Jessica Colbank. Elation, pure joy. What did you say when you brought her to jail? Home sweet home. And then we shut the door with a big old grin on my face. Case closed for Colbank, but for Skylar's parents, Dave and Mary. Sicko. Learning the killer's identities not only brought more heartache and devastation, but also fury. They're acting like they really care. And they're the ones that's responsible for the whole thing the whole time. Casting devastating new light on that moment when Sheila was overcome with emotion in Skylar's bedroom. Oh my lord, we believe that garbage. Can you imagine your daughter's killer sitting on your daughter's bed crying and the mother putting her arms around her daughter's killer. It's got her trusted, those two little witches. It's gonna cost her her life. Because yeah. friends like that, you don't want any enemies, that's for sure. How could they do that to their best friend? And the reason Rachel gave, that they just didn't like her? That's the biggest blind of crap I've ever heard in my life. There has to be a reason. You don't do stuff like that for no reason. When we come back, the real motive? Was Skylar hiding something about her friends? Did she know too much? Skylar knew stuff about him that they didn't want out. Her secret diary revealed. 2020 continues with Unfriended. Here again, Ryan Smith. She's a killer nobody would have suspected. The fresh-faced high school senior, Sheila Eddy, smirking in her first court appearance. After months of secrecy, the truth is revealed. Skylar Niece's best friends, Rachel and Sheila, were actually her worst enemies. The shocking news, they had lured her into the woods and brutally stabbed her to death. The search for Skylar Niece is over. Rachel confessed. Two teenagers implicated for stabbing a third friend to death. Many of Skylar's friends hear about it at school. It devastated me. I actually had to get up and leave class. If you don't want to be friends with someone anymore, you just delete them on Facebook. Like, you don't go and get rid of them. Kelly Kearns has known one of the killers, Rachel, since the day she was born, considering her like a daughter. When someone tried to tell me that they stabbed them, I, I, no way in heck. You couldn't believe that was your Rachel. You can't tell me these girls stabbed her. And it wasn't until I opened the paper when I was all guilty. And her picture. The pictures. Today, the looking at the photograph of Rachel taken just hours after she murdered her friend, Kelly is floored by that smiling face. What strikes me about this picture is I don't see anything on her face that reflects what she did. It just makes you feel, you know, what'd you miss? And at the heart of the wrenching questions, how could two teenagers kill their best friend? They say they just didn't like her anymore which is typical of teens, but teens typically don't kill each other when they fall out of like. I think it was because Skylar knew stuff about him that they didn't want out. Stuff, he says, that was hidden in Skylar's diary, where he says she wrote about a sexual relationship between Sheila and Rachel, which she witnessed at a sleepover at Rachel's house. Daylene Berry and Jeff Fuller describe the incident in intimate detail in the new book they've written, called Pretty Little Killers. Sheila and Rachel became involved sexually, it appears. Skylar was forced to watch because she knew if she left the bedroom, they had all been drinking and they'd all be in trouble. Several weeks after the sleepover, Skylar tweets, I tell the whole school all the I have on everyone, which is a lot. Hashtag, if I could get away with it. Then, one month before she is murdered, 
there is another tweet from Skyler. Just know, I know. Rachel and Sheila had formed some type of a sex relationship that they believed Skyler knew about it and would ultimately tell everyone. But the nieces say that Skyler never would have acted on the veiled threats. She had a lot of gay and lesbian friends that didn't bother her. Now, she didn't care if you were pink, purple, yellow. That was just Skyler. Why do you think they killed her? For the thrill of it, to see if they could get away with it. I feel that they had a strong dislike for Skyler. So it's fitting they stabbed her in the back. A year and a half after the murder, Rachel faces justice. She pleads guilty to second degree murder, a lesser charge based on her cooperation. Finally, in court, she directly addresses the niece family. I'm so sorry. I don't know if there's a proper way to make this apology because there are not even words to describe the guilt and remorse that I feel each day for what I've done. The person that did that was not the real me, not the person I am, not what I'm made of and not what I believe in. Rachel's mom weeps as she listens. Again, I'm so sorry and I pray each day for everyone involved and I pray each day for forgiveness. She can take her apologies and everything else and sit on them because that's about what they're worth to me and my wife. She has done nothing but make our lives a living hell since this day one. She was crying, she was emotional. You didn't think that was remorse? To me, that was her final act in front of an audience. She's the big actress, star of the high school plays. This was her last Broadway performance. At her arraignment, a defiant Sheila Eddy pleads not guilty. Sheila Eddy, how do you plead? But later, in a surprise development, she changes her plea. Sheila Eddy, how do you plead to the offense of murder in the first degree? Guilty. Guilty to first degree murder. She offered no words of remorse. Why do you think that Sheila has never apologized? Because she's not sorry. You don't apologize for murdering somebody in cold blood because she meant to do it. It's a good thing she didn't give an apology. People think it's horrible because she didn't. I commend her. Don't stand up there and lie to me and tell me you feel guilty. Rachel's family described her actions in a statement as unforgivable and inexcusable. She is now at a juvenile facility sentenced to 30 years in prison. She will soon be transferred to adult prison. The same prison, in fact, where Sheila, the girl she turned in, is now serving a life sentence. But both girls could be released on parole by their early 30s. If I'm dead and gone, somebody will be there to make sure they talk to the parole board and, and these animals don't get out of their cages. If you could say anything to Sheila and Rachel right now, what would you say? Rotten hell. Skyler's friends are still trying to process their loss and mourn the milestones they are experiencing without her. Skyler never got to go to a prom. Isn't that your boyfriend? Mary and Dave never got to see her get all dressed up and get the bouquet and get everything else. In memory of their only child, Dave and Mary Niece helped pass Skyler's law in West Virginia. It requires Amber Alerts for all missing children. This is Skyler's room. When you come in here, does it give you any sense of Skyler now? Yeah, it still does. They continue to treasure every item that belonged to Skyler. Some of them don't mean anything. They were hers, so we'll always keep them. She has a bunch of cards and drawings. Yeah, see, her friends were always sending her a birthday wish for my friend. Uh-oh. Huh. That's what I think of that one. Yeah. That was from Sheila, by the way. The card reads, Happy birthday. Love, Sheila. BFF. Love you like a sister for life. For Dave, it's just one more reminder of the searing betrayal that has destroyed their world. Because of that outward appearance, people don't want to believe they're capable. I've still, to this day, have people say, there's no way, it's just those two girls. Yes, it's those two girls. This crime, to me, is one of those crimes that go down in the books as truly evil. Best friends from hell. There couldn't be a more fitting description. Today, on a hidden road, deep in the woods of a town called Brave, there is a silent shrine. They say this is pretty much where she was found. 
the site of Schuyler's murder has been transformed into a memorial. On this visit, a stranger had written a note to Schuyler. This one says, rest in peace, sweet Schuyler. So are the angels. <sighs> Baby, I'm so sorry. If there's one lesson to be learned in here, and one lesson only, know who your friends are. We just heard that with good behavior, the killers could be out of prison on parole by the time they're in their 30s. The question for you tonight at home, is that fair? What do you think? Let us know. Use the hashtag ABC2020. And Elizabeth and I will be right back. And that's 2020 is Friday night. Thanks so much for watching. I'm David New. And I'm Elizabeth Vargas. For all of us at 2020 and ABC News, have a great night and a great weekend. Every day, more Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. The show everyone's talking about. Rising Star, live Sunday on ABC. Skyler's parents are beside themselves. Their daughter is gone. Can you imagine? It's evil. Tonight on an all-new 2020, Unfriended. A popular teenage girl lured from home for a mysterious joyride in the middle of the night. But she never comes back. I was scared to death. I didn't know where my baby was. Does this creepy game by BFFs, recorded on a cell phone, hold an answer? Would you guys rather suffocate or get shot? Get shot. Shot. Drowning or suffocating? Suffocating. Tonight, 2020, taking you inside a jaw-dropping mystery. It's a race against time at this point. And the secret world of mean girls gone wild. Give me the phone. <laughs> no, this is over. This is over. <laughs> Hurry up. From cryptic messages on Facebook and Twitter to a real-life crime scene in the woods. Scholar screaming why. What happens when three's a crowd and one person gets cast aside? What secrets do they have? And who do you believe when pretty little liars see seem to be everywhere. Her words were, I have to tell you the truth about what happened last night. Tonight, what can happen when you get unfriended? Best friends from hell. There couldn't be a more fitting description. Here now, David Muir and Elizabeth Vargas. Good evening. Your teenagers could be planning it right now, this Friday night, sneaking out of your house, joyriding around town. But for one girl, a midnight joyride would be just the start of a mystery that would devastate a small community. Where was Skylar Niece? And what did she mean by this ominous tweet? Hashtag if I could get away with it. That's the question, get away with what? And right here tonight, we take you inside a massive search, the powder keg of high school, where some of the most important clues are hiding in plain sight. Those texts and tweets and Facebook fights between BFFs, where getting unfriended is just the beginning. Here's Ryan Smith. They were 16 and inseparable. Best friends, high school sophomores, Sheila, Skyler, and Rachel. It was always those three together. You barely ever saw one of them by themselves. Silly in their selfies. Giggly teenage girls. They're pretty, they're sociable, they're popular. But behind their smiles, secrets that would shock everyone they knew. The level of deception, it's mind boggling. The police were just as shocked as we were. No one was expecting anything like that. Pure evil. Nestled in the Green Mountains of West Virginia, the city of Morgantown, home to West Virginia University, known as a friendly family place. What's it like here in Morgantown? It's peaceful. It's a small town that's growing really fast. Nice people. Dave and Mary Niece live in an apartment in the tiny Morgantown suburb Star City. Dave works at a local Walmart. Mary at a medical office. Their lives wrapped around their only child, Skylar. Hey, gorgeous. Treasuring every spin. What a beautiful ballerina. Every laugh. <laughs> and every childhood memory. It was the time she had the tea party for me. And after Mary came home, she noted that Skylar couldn't reach a faucet. I've been drinking toilet water for the whole tea party. That was a good memory. At the time, it wasn't a good memory. <laughs> yeah, I'm a crazy girl. Daddy's a crazy boy. <laughs> she was daddy's little girl. I spoiled her beyond rotten. 
Skylar was very loyal to her friends, the people she thought was her friends. When Skylar was eight years old, she met another spirited child 